G'day. Today's video is a collection of, of um, things to watch for, I guess you'd call them. Uh, either when someone comes to you and says, can you make this part, or whether you're doing some design work and you, uh, you want to put a feature in. Uh, these are things that, um, well, I find cause added complication and so should be avoided. That's not to say you, you will never have to do some of these things, sometimes you will, but at least if you know what to look for, uh, you can be on guard and if someone comes and says, look, can you do me this particular feature, you can negotiate with it. Uh, if, you're, if you're designing something yourself and you think I need a something or other, you can then think again and say, actually, no, that could cause me some problems. Uh, I'm going to have another look. So these are just a few things that I've, I've seen over the years that uh, cause added complication for people. Um, some of them go away with, with CNC because you can do all sorts of strange things, but if you're doing it in a manual machine shop, these are things you need to, uh, to watch out for. Uh, apologies in advance for the quality of the audio and the video. Uh, some of these bits and pieces, a number of these bits and pieces, were filmed some time ago uh, on the uh, old camera, and uh, so uh, sadly the quality isn't uh, necessarily as good as the, as the current stuff. First on my list are these things, uh, countersunk screws. There's nothing wrong with them as such, but you've got to be careful where you're using them. There are two issues I see with these. One of them is that if you put this into a soft material, like a, a plastic or something like that, that angle on there has a bit of a wedging action. And so what you could be doing is stressing the plastic, and so it's going to crack around the screw holes. So in that case, you're probably better off using a pan head screw uh, with, a, with a washer or something like that under there to spread the load and make sure that the load is sort of square to the surface and not to one side, but sometimes you can't avoid it. The other thing I don't like about them is if they're used in a group. If you can imagine having a, a, a plate with four holes countersunk like that, um, if that plate is out of a line, that wedging action of the head is going to pull the plate across. So if you haven't got the holes in your plate and the hole, your, your tapped holes in your job exactly the same dimension, you're going to have this thing fighting itself. Okay, So that, that could cause you problems. These are great for, for clearance situations where you need the clearance, but they're the sort of screw that, as a general run-of-the-mill thing, I avoid if I can, I can use something else. And I'm, so I'm, in this particular situation, I may actually counterbore that and put a socket head cap screw in there. Uh, relying on the on the, the float there and once again the clamping is vertical not uh, there there isn't a horizontal component to it the next one to watch out for is if you have a drawing which calls up a square bottom hole the best way to drill holes is basically with a drill now the points on those are either 118 degrees or 135 most commonly and so that'll come down and give you a a point on there. Nothing wrong with that, but occasionally someone will think that they need a square bottom hole for some purpose, and so that becomes awkward. Um, you could use a, a milling cutter, but typically there's a fish tail, what we call a fish tail on these things, there's about a two degree relief on there. So you're not going to get a, a, a square bottom hole, you're going to get a hole with a, uh, a bit of a form to it. The best way I've got of drilling square bottomed holes, uh, I have a set of stub drills and I've put a flat on them. And so I can come down and, and drill that. But I've got to drill a pilot hole because I've just lost the self-centering part of the drill. So it's an extra operation that if you don't have to do it, uh, try not to. Similar things if you wanted a rounded hole or something like that. You can sharpen up milling cutters to do that. You can sharpen up drill bits to do that sort of thing. But if you can just use a standard drill, much simpler, much much uh, cleaner. Another one that can cause some problems is if someone decides they need a, a square hole in a, in a cavity. Square holes are very difficult to produce. Uh, they can be done. You can use an EDM process perhaps, or uh, drill that with a very small drill there and step these out, uh, possibly use a slotting head. But once again, if you can avoid having to do that, you're better off. Now, the two ways around that, if you have a square part that has to go in there, you can either take off the corners, as I've done here, and that's and, and this was because I had a bit of round bar that I was making this out of. The other option is you overrun the corner with your milling cutter. So instead of stopping there, you come and you'll stop out here somewhere. So 
there's a, a flat surface here and a flat surface there and so the square corner of the part can sit into that hole. This illustrates the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Here I've got a square corner uh, and I've ran the cutter out past the, the corner of the slot so that I've got two edges which are neatly defining my, my slot. While I have this part here too, another thing to avoid is convex radii. If I, if I said, oh yes, I want a nice radius in that corner, I'd be causing myself no end of grief. This is, this is like this because it's been uh, put on a, on a lathe, or sorry, it's come from round stock and it's come off the lathe that way. Um, but if, if someone decided they definitely needed, an, say, an R5 radio in there, well, you've got to set up on a dividing head or something like that. Not so bad with CNC because you just say to the, to the computer, yeah, just put a radius in there and it'll, it'll work it all out for you. But if you're doing this manually, um, trying to put radio in there is, is more complicated. So you're better off either having a, a sharp corner or having basically a, a chamfer. Another one to avoid is having a, a, a full form around a, a square piece of material. Uh, I've done that here, but I haven't got that as a, as a tight fit. So a loose fit is okay, a tight fit is, is a problem. Um, and the, the reason for that is that, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. One is if the coefficient of expansion of this material is different from this, you may find you've got problems where some days it fits and some days it, it doesn't. And I had a, uh, a guy come in who wanted a bracket made out of aluminium to fit over a wooden beam. And you can imagine with wood, when it's very dry, it shrinks. When it's wet, moist, it swells. And so you could have something where I make a nice tight fitting bracket to go on a wooden beam. And some days it fits and some days it doesn't. Now this bracket was to slide back and forth as an adjustment thing. So you can imagine that there will be some days you couldn't adjust the position of this bracket. Okay, so that's something you avoid. Now, if you have to have something like that for, for strength or whatever, what I'd recommend is getting a couple of pieces of angle, putting the angle up there, and then putting a plate on top. So you can clamp your angle up tight to the, to the, 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 the beam you want to, and then you clamp your flat, you know, whatever it is you want to mount on there onto that surface. And at least that way, you get a good fit here and a, and a good fit there. Another one to put on the list of things that could be troublesome and uh, avoid if you can is tapping blind holes, uh, particularly in, in thin material where you need a decent amount of thread. And the reason for that is that the swarf from the tapping can build up at the bottom of the hole and gum things up, jam things up. Similarly, when you run the tap into the bottom of the hole, if you're not careful, you can snap a tap. And I did that just recently because it was an old tap, small thread, a bit enthusiastic, snap. Um, you're better off having through holes or if you've got a, a situation where a blind hole is appropriate having as much hole as you can so that there's sufficient room there for the tap to be able to, to go in uh, a decent distance. Another one to bear in mind when you're designing things or, or looking at parts is the amount of material you have to take off. If you have things which are just over a standard size, it means you need to buy the next part up, and so you have to take away a lot of material. Now, um, this is just a part I grabbed off the, the bench, and I've, I've actually welded a bit of flat bar onto a, a machined part. But if you imagine that someone came to you and said, I want you to make one of these out of one piece, you've got a whole bunch of material to take off here. Um, you're better off having, say, a part that's 48 millimeters thick and then being able to machine down a piece of 50 mil thick material, then you are having a piece that's, uh, say, 52 millimeters thick and having to take that out of a, a 63 or a 65 millimeter thick piece of material. One problem that people don't think about much is what I basically call a full form fit, which is where you've got a part like that, where you want those two parts to be a, a good fit and that part to be, that, that joint to be a good fit and that joint to be a good fit. Now, that means that you've got to be very precise in all your machining operations. So sometimes it's warranted, some, it's, it's necessary, but in this particular case, I'm actually going to take a little bit of material off here and, and try and leave that so I've got contact there, but I've actually got clearance there, and that will give me a much better part. So if you can avoid having that, that full form um, sort of fit, 
then you, you're better off because you're eliminating extra operations, a bit of handwork perhaps, and all the rest of it. The nature of machining is that sooner or later you're going to have to tap holes. However, you want to try and avoid, if you can, very small fine holes. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, the pitch of the thread is fine, so you haven't got as much strength in the root as you have with something with a much bigger pitch. And so they'll strip more easily. The drills and taps to make them are, are a little less uh, robust. And if you're in soft materials, um, it doesn't take much to be able to strip these things out. So as a rule of thumb, I say, well, the minimum size I really want to go is an M6 if I have to, to tap a, uh, a hole for a bolt or something like that. Uh, anything lower than that, and I need to carefully think about it. If I'm doing a sleeve or a pulley or something to go into a shaft, uh, I'll look at that and, and say, well, I want a minimum of one diameter thread there. And so if that's very thin, and sometimes I have to use an M3 or an M4, but uh, for something like this, I could probably get away with an M5 or an M6. The other thing that I look at is if I've got, if it's a thin collar and I've got a hole there, I want to have about a diameter of material either side of the of the, the, the thread fast. And this piece is typical. Uh, this tongue is about eight millimeters wide, and although it's what that be eight ten millimeters deep there. Uh, and so I could put an M6 in there quite happily, I wouldn't have enough uh, material left on the sides there. So I've had to go for an M3, which was an absolute pain in the neck because it was stainless steel. I tried hard to find an example of this next one uh, here in the, in the workshop, but I've, I've been sensible or someone's been sensible, I don't know how that happened. But that is for assembly of parts, you want to be careful about putting things down the bottom of holes or, or features for assembly purposes. So this particular nut here uh, sits down in there, it's recessed so the top is flat and that's not a problem because I, I've, I've made sure I can get a socket in there and it's not too far down. I did once have a job where I had to get to a screw, this is a repair thing, bottom of a hole about that big and I actually bought a special screwdriver to do that so I put a tipped insert in there and I managed to, to, to just reach that. But this is the sort of thing you've got to think about when you're assembling. Um, if you haven't got good access, it may be more difficult. You may need special tool. The last one on my list of, of things to watch out for are different materials. Now, quite often we use different materials in designs because they have different properties, but that also limits what you can do. And as a simple example, um, you know, here's a piece of aluminium. This is a little stainless bracket I've made up. Now, if I want to put that on there, I'm now limited to using some form of mechanical fastener. I can't weld that on there. It may be that, well, there's no need for this to be out of stainless and you can make it out of aluminium and, and then you could weld it on or you could machine it out of one piece or something like that. Um, you know, another related issue is, is the thermal and mechanical properties change. So, you know, this has got a particular strength, it's got a particular thermal expansion. This has got a different strength and a different thermal expansion. And so you need to watch that. Um, and even something as simple as if you have uh, an assembly which is maybe a piece of aluminium sitting next to a piece of steel and you put that in your milling machine because you want to get a, a, a flat surface across there you've now got the situation where the cutting speeds for this are different from the cutting speeds for this and so you then need to do a bit of a compromise you know do you cut most of the way across then change your speed do you leave it on the lower speed and just take your time all those sorts of things there you have it there's a list it's not exhaustive of things that uh, I watch for when people come in and say, can you make a part up for me? Or, or even when I'm designing parts up for myself, uh, things to avoid or, or think about, you know, do I really need to have that feature in there? So well, I hope that's been of use to people. Thanks to those who've inspired me in my uh, metalworking journey. And uh, please share this if you think it's worthwhile.